So aside from the fact that everyone's exhausted, Paul and I realize this feels a little bit belated, maybe our, our session, because we've already talked quite a bit about the social valence of art and the avant-garde system. So I'm gonna try and direct us forward. And I think we are finally moving a little bit. So uh, maybe we can pick up the productive part of the conversation. Um, and Paul will talk about the market. So I'm gonna talk about Borgia's other big idea. And for me, his main idea, um, which is that art provides a powerful means of social distinction. And what I'm gonna say is all pretty obvious sounding or dumb sounding, um, which maybe maybe it is, but I think it's something that's very, very difficult to internalize. So even though I chose this for historiographic reasons, um, I think it's worth hearing again. So the ability to make choices and judgments equates with social status, whether you're a curator using her intuition, a critic exercising his eye, um, a collector wielding a bank account, or a critical theorist using his fine mind. All of these figures, and the artist above them all, accrue what Borgia calls social or cultural capital. Cultural capital means you get to decide what students learn in school, and I, I guess I would want to say with some, something like the Krauss reading, it's not the original that matters, it's the copy. You know, so when we're talking about formational moments and, you know, it's the cop, it's all those thousands of Xeroxes that, that matters. Um, you get to decide what students learn in school, what people talk about, and what you need to sound like to be an artist. And I think Borgia is really, um, for someone who knows very little about contemporary art, and you can tell that from some of his details, that he is remarkably per perceptive in pointing to things like the rise of discourse. Um, years before, someone like Howard Singerman, who knows a lot about contemporary art, was really writing in a quite detailed way about the rise of discourse at the center of contemporary art. Bourdieu happens on it without really knowing so much, without being an insider on the f in the field. So vast social resources are mobilized to support these decisions, uh, like the vast social resources we see here at the Clark. Um, which is a deceptively mild form of social violence that affects us all. Who shows and who doesn't show? Who teaches 5-5 five five and who teaches 2-1? Who is on stage and who is in the audience? Capital isn't just a metaphor, it affects how we all live. Bourdieu reminds us that art theorists themselves, as competitors for the accumulations of cultural capital, are inside and not outside society. In this way, he upsets the traditional privileged positions claimed by artists and intellectuals with respect to politics. This is why both Latour and Ranciere both feel the need to take a sort of whack at him in passing in their text without really discussing his work. He shows that criticality is itself part of the art ideology, increasingly necessary and homologous to that of avant-garde art, which is why I would want to start to replace the term criticality with doubt. I've been hoping that it would trouble that a little bit. He is not saying, however, that art is a bankrupt exercise, like Debord or other people who sort of go to that extreme, rather that its actual functioning is misrecognized. Bourdieu demands a radical reorient reorientation. For me, reading this particular essay, and even more his book, Distinction, was the closest I've ever come to a revelatory or religious experience, a psychedelic turning of the world on its head. The revelation is in part a more objective under my own personal experience in the field, the ways that various forms of knowledge and work are valued, and I recommend to all graduate students to read Distinction, um, as well as The Poverty of Student Life for, to, to help and analyze their own experiences. But the other mind-opening and equally liberate, liberatory aspect of the text, for me, is his take on history, which is, I think, the thing that, not the thing that most people are interested in with, um, with Bourdieu, and I hope the thing that could be productive moving forward. Bourdieu reframes the apparent history of seemingly successive avant-garde movements, each one criticizing the previous understanding of art. This understanding obtains both in modernism and postmodernism as one of competing positions. His view is supported by the simple fact that many of his putative mo movements, abex, pop, and minimalism, for example, coexisted. It also recasts the potted history um, that, is that has representation supplanted by abstraction, um, which structures even the sophisticated critical accounts we read for today. And I would say one of the things to think about when we're thinking about history and criticism together, and I said last night, and I'll say it again, I don't want to re- um, reawaken that opposition between them, but is to think if your history is bad, can your theory be good? As Bourdieu puts it, to introduce difference is to produce time. 
By the 1970s, this coexistence or competition became impossible to ignore, emerging as the dreaded pluralism opposed by anxious critics correctly to the ideology of the avant-garde. Today, consciousness of this competition has created the crisis du jour, a seeming excess of contemporaneity in which the simultaneity of competing interests is all too clear. Putting aside the modernist model of writing history as moralizing progress frees us to ask what other histories might look like. Without the distinguishing blessing of avant-garde status, there would be more artists considered, including those that are under-recognized and over-recognized by the market, and th I guess that's where I see myself working in both sides of the, that equation, and a serious attempt to account for rather than dismiss a plural world, as did academic critics who for so long restricted the discussion of contemporary art to a handful of artists. We would also have to th rethink what art's actual social engagement was if we were gonna argue for its privileged position in relationship to politics. The apparent necessity of asking these questions, of the imperative to re-understand art, is the reason behind the renewed energy in art and art history as I see it, a new openness. And I see this as a, a promising moment, not an elegiac one in the field. It also motivates the somewhat pathetic attempts of critical thinkers like Ranciere to localize some new theoretical turn that would still maintain their own status in the world. Pathetic because they leave us inside the very system of belief they claim to challenge. Bourdieu shows us the world is most, both simpler and more complicated than its consecrated image. On the one hand, there really are just the 1% and the 99%, with artists and intellectuals navigating the rapids between them. On the other, the efforts of artists and other cultural producers to create meaning form a complex set of practices irreducible to a single hierarchy of value or a sequence in time. Thank you.